So how, how will the Terrans react towards the, the rise of the artifact and, and the ideology of, of cosmism? What, what, what will they do? Now, um, as, as I said earlier, I think this issue of species dominance will become the number one issue, the number one question of our century. It, it will dominate our global politics in, in the same way, analogously, that in the 19th and 20th century, the number one question was who should own capital? Who should own the machines? Should, should they be privately owned? Or should they be owned by everybody, if you like, by the, by the state? So uh, under the influence of Marx, this incredibly powerful political philosopher, after what there was a time just a few decades ago, about half of the world's population were living in Marxist regimes, Marxist governments. So this, this was an incredibly powerful ideology. You know, the, the two differing answers to the question of who, who should own the machines. And uh, Marx labelled uh, our, our system that, that our Western countries use, where the answer is they should be privately owned. And so the people, these private citizens, these private individuals who owned capital, uh, he used the French word and called them capitaliste, you know, the, the people who own the capital. And the other, the other ideology, you know, the other answer to this major question is that, uh, well, they should be communally owned. They should be owned by everybody. So they were owned by the whole community. So communityists, in a sense. And you can shorten that to communist. Right? So you had, you had this bitter division this, um, between the capitalists and the communists over this issue of who should own capital. And why was it so divisive? Why, you know, why did it divide humanity so bitterly? Because imagine, and this is, this is Marx's, one of Marx's major arguments, if, if the machines became hugely more productive than the cottage industries, when, when you were making cloth and whatever by hand, you had a certain productivity level. You, know, you could only produce so many garments, so many yards of material per hour or whatever, right? And then along come the machines that, that are uh, like steam engine powered and so forth. And they were just so much more productive. So they, they could produce far more material per hour than you could by hand with your hand powered machines. So the price of their production went down. So you, in your cottage engine, you couldn't compete. You, you, you just couldn't compete with the prices of these machines. So you went out of business. So how do you survive? How do you, how do you live? Well, you had to, but the only solution there was, was for you to sell your labor power as, as a laborer, as an employee, to the owners of the machines, the capitalists, the industrialists, the company owners, the CEOs, if you like. So there were an army of these displaced people who were thrown out of work from the cottage industries by, by this industrial revolution and they were easily exploitable. Right? There were no trade unions in those days, just you know, the concept didn't exist. That, that, that had to be invented. There were no labour parties. I mean, only you know, in those few countries that had the vote, that were quasi-democratic, most people didn't have the right to vote. That had to be fought for. Right? through political reforms and so forth, all, all kinds of you know, political developments had to occur. So in the early days, capitalism was brutal, vicious, exploitative, you know, the robber barons. So Marx, Marx was saying, these capitalists, they employ people, pay them a pittance, no trade unions, no, no force on them to raise wages, and they were just readily exploited. So if you feel yourself that you, you, you're working, I don't know, let's say 12 hours a day, and for about six to eight of those hours, you're earning your wage, but the other eight hours or whatever, you're working for the employer. Right? 
to his benefit. So you're getting exploited. You're being robbed, in a sense. Well, that makes you really angry once you become conscious of that. So you, you, know, you read Marx and uh, you get angry. Yeah? So hence political parties and so forth. Now that issue of who should own capital eventually led to almost, very close, almost World War III, a nuclear war in 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you know the history, but basically the Americans had missiles in Turkey, I think, within range of Moscow. That scared the Russians shitless. Yeah. So the Russians put missiles in Cuba within range of Washington. Americans didn't like that at all. So they told the Russians, stop sending these missiles to Cuba. And they put up a naval blockade of American ships and the world just held its breath. I, mean, I, I was, this is 62, I was 15 years old. I didn't fully understand what was going on. I wasn't mature enough, still too much of a child. But my God, I remember the fear in the eyes of my teachers at, at high school. And I remember one saying to, to another, another teacher, is this the last day? Boy, that, that's sung home, right? It made me feel incredibly emotional. And, and these two teachers, terrified, terrified. Because right? it was that day that the decision would be made whether, you know, there were two nuclear powers almost ready to destroy each other. And uh, President Kennedy at the time was under tremendous pressure from, from the military to first strike. You know, the, the Americans felt that they were in a superior position in terms of sheer nuclear power to just wipe out the Russians. So it was a really scary time. And over, over what issue? Over the issue of who should own capital, basically. Okay. So by analogy, that question is trivial in comparison to who or what should be dominant species, right? Because this time, it's, it's the, whole, the whole species on the planet, human beings. This, that's what's at stake now. So, uh, the Terrans, how, how will they react as the Arthalek rises, as they get smarter and smarter? And what, what I mean, what, what can they do? So, how, how will this play out? Let me bring in the name, uh, my, my major ideological rival in the, in the world media, I suppose, is, is Ray Kurzweil, you know, a rather famous name in the United States. Now, he, he said, if it comes to a war between the Cosmists and the Terrans, he makes this interesting, colourful analogy, that that would be like a war between the U.S. Army and the Amish. And if you're Americans, here, 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 I was in New York one time for a uh, premiere of a film uh, on this theme, and all the Americans laughed because <laughs> they know what they... So if, if you're not familiar with who the Amish are, they're an American religious sect, and they have this odd belief that they don't use any technology that's more modern than 19th century. Okay? So they, they ride around in horse and buggy. They don't use telephones, internet, te computers or whatever. Right? They just live in, with technology that's 19th century or earlier. That's just part of their religious belief. Right? So common sense is, you know, <laughs> if there are a war between them and the modern today's US Army, it's, it's obvious who would win, right? It'd, just, it'd be no contest. Right? That's, that's his, Ray Kurzweil's term, no contest. Now, common sense says if the cyborgs and the artileks are well advanced, then if it does come to a war between them, the Terrans, the cyborgs and the artileks, like as a group, against the Terrans, Agreed. I mean, I, I just have to agree. 
just be no contest. But you have to get to that point. And that's, that's the issue. That's, that's where I, I see uh, you know, the major developments happening before you get to that point. So what, what will the Terrans be doing? The Terrans are not stupid. Right? They, they will know, they will be very conscious that they have a time window of opportunity. If they just sit on their bums, twiddling, twiddling their thumbs, doing nothing, while that time window closes, then eventually the, the artifacts will come into being, the cyborgs will be there, and the Terrans will lose if, if it comes to a conflict. Right? They just wouldn't be sufficiently intelligent or capable, powerful enough to, to win against that well, the threesome, you know, the cosmos, the cyborgs, and the artifacts. Right? Well, you can lump these two almost together because they're virtually the same thing, the cyborgs and the, the artifacts. Okay, so imagine now uh, early, late, well, let's say a bit beyond mid-century, 21st century, let's say 2050s or whatever. Imagine now you're living more or less in a global state and you, you are a globen, you know, globa, the, the, the world state name. You're a globen politician and you're Terran, imagine. So what would your strategy be? What, how... What, what would you do if you, you were an ardent Terran? You have a hatred of the cosmos. The cyborgs around you are really creeping you out, scaring you. What would your strategy be? And you know you cannot wait. You cannot wait too long. Because every year you see these you know, the machines and the artifacts and the cyborgs getting smarter and smarter every year. And more and more of a threat. What would you do? Well... I think you'd have to first strike. Right? You would go on the biggest witch hunt that humanity has ever known. Right? Anyone expressing even the slightest in favour comment about being cosmist or cyborg, you would exterminate. It would be the greatest, most paranoid witch hunt ever. Because of what's at stake here? Well, you, as a human being the dominance of the human species. It's a fundamental ideological power struggle between the survival of the human beings or the creation of gods, in a sense. I mean, that's how I express the issue of species dominance in, in the terms of a, of a slogan. Do we build gods or do we build our potential exterminators? Right? Like a pithy slogan that, that sums up the, the, the issue in, in just half a line. So, so I see the, the strategists of the Terrans arguing there's a time window of opportunity. They can't wait too long because if they do, they will be outclassed by, by the intellectual level of the cyborgs and the, cost, you know, the, the artifacts. So they will have to first strike. But cosmos are no fools either. Right? They will have their spies and they will infiltrate the organizations of the Terrans and they will listen carefully and they will read carefully all the arguments of the 